Welcome to Parenting Great Kids. Today, we're about to dive into a fascinating subject that we've rarely explored, the incredible intersection of sports and raising kids. While winning in sports undoubtedly feels good, we believe that youth sports offer something far greater than a victory on the field or court. It's about instilling values, teaching life lessons, and fostering personal growth in our kids. Today, we have the honor of hosting Coach Denny Duran, a man of many talents. He's a former football star who led his team to national championships and earned a place in Louisiana Tech Football Hall of Fame. But Denny's journey took a unique turn when he left professional football after hearing a higher calling. He became the youngest head college football coach in America, founded Evangel University's football program, and coached at Evangel Christian Academy, achieving national recognition and rewriting offensive records. Beyond sports, Denny's a pastor, a leadership coach, a speaker, and a driving force behind Winner's Circle International, a nonprofit with diverse outreach programs. His talents mm -hmm. extend to film, music, and innovation, where he's garnered awards and patents. I'm out of breath. Welcome to Parenting Great Kids, Coach Duran. Thank you so much, Meg. It's so good to be with you. You know, that is a, a very impressive um history of accomplishments. Um, but I'm, I'm sensing pretty, I'm pretty old. I'm pretty old, <laughs> no, mate. So that's not, why. <laughs> no, yeah. no, I was gonna say you're a very, very humble man. So we've got a lot to sort of unpack here too. And I'm most interested, of course, in the uh documentary series. Um so Denny, your journey and the story of the Evangel Christian Academy's football program are the focus of the docu-series God Family football. What what inspired you to create a docu-series around this unique story? And, and what do you believe sets it apart from mm. other sports documentaries? Well, really, it, I wasn't inspired at all to do it. Uh, there is a young man that I met when he was 14 years old, and we've stayed in touch for a lot of years. I became like a, um uncle to him. Mm -hmm. And so he would call and check on me through the years, and I would ask him what he was doing. And he was a country music star for a while, and then he went into producing in L.A. and was doing some things that were really interesting. And he would often say to me, now, I am coming to do your story one day. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what that story was, but he loved the whole football idea mm -hmm. of what we were doing here at Evangel and doing our best just to raise up young Christian leaders from these kids. And so uh, he called me one day and he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm about to come out of retirement mm -hmm. coaching. And he said, tell me about that. I said, well, we haven't won a game this year. And they're all freshmen and eighth graders. And I said, I just don't think I can resist this challenge. Mm -hmm. I said, so I'm coming. He said, when are you coming out? I said, tomorrow. So you, said, so you wanted out. to do yeah. it because you knew it was going to be so hard. Well, I, I would love to raise those babies, you know, yeah, up yeah. to be great players. That would have been, you know, and was. It was amazing. It was better than I thought it would be, honestly. And, of course, now they're seniors, and it's so cool, and it's a good story. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, I want to come in and do that story. So he came right in while they were freshmen and sophomores, and he shot a sizzle reel, and he began to shoot reams and reams of, of footage. And then, of course, the rest is history, his vision became a reality. Mm -hmm. So it, it really wasn't my vision to put all of that together, nor did I have anything to do with it except to provide the everyday practice routine that uh, that we enjoy just, you know, on a regular and daily daily basis. Well, you didn't have, you had an inspiration of a different kind because yeah. to step into a very difficult position in coaching football would be tough because I imagine football coaches want the the best chance of success when they mm -hmm. go into a season and when they have their players but you didn't really know that going into this you were you were sort of doing the opposite correct well yeah uh you know success here means uh, a lot of different things meg mm -hmm. well some of my, my some of my most successful moments have not translated to success on the field mm -hmm. 
we have watched young men here over the last, you know, 30 years, 35 years, uh, grow up to become wonderful fathers and great citizens, uh, tremendous husbands. And those have been the successes that I'm proudest of. <laughs> when I see a young man come back to evangel on a Friday night, and he has a wonderful wife and a couple of great kids, and I can look into his eyes and know that you know, he's not abusing any substance and, and that he is focused on his life and his faith. I mean, that there's nothing that compares to that. And so after all of these years, and I am a winner. I mean, I, I want to win. Mm -hmm. That is a desire. I have those natural coaches' desires that I want them to execute well, and I want them to go out and do their best, and I want them to earn the victories that, uh, that they experience. But at the, sa in the, same, at the same time, I'm not going to agonize over losses on the field or when we don't have enough talent to win football games, or even when it's my fault that I haven't put it together well, mm -hmm. because I understand that we really do have a higher calling, and that is to see these young men become who they were destined to become. That's an everyday task, and it really translates, I think, to the focus of your wonderful life and teaching mm -hmm. uh, people to raise children and and uh, exploring this whole ever-challenging area of, you know, how do I raise great kids? Uh, because it's, it's this, they're, they're the same principles exact. I have seven children, counting my, uh, my wonderful uh, adopted son who came into this family and just has made us so much better. But I raised six kids because my seventh came in his teenage years. Mm -hmm. And what I can say from experience is the same principles that I had to use and employ and that my wife, who, who is the superstar in this story, she is the reason that we have the children we have. But we both had to employ the same principles there that I'm employing every day uh, with, with my players. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I was so excited when I found out I was going to be with you because, you know, I, really what I want to do is interview you. I want to know <laughs> one of the things that yeah. you know yes. that are going to help me be better tomorrow on the, on the practice field. Well, I know every boy comes into playing for you the first time with a very different background, family background, socioeconomic, whatever. But would you say most of these boys come in with a faith, with no faith? Where are they in their spiritual journey when they come to play football with you? Oh, it spans the spectrum. It, it really does. We have kids that have no understanding of who God is. They've never opened a Bible. Uh, their parents have not expressed any need for faith in their lives. And then we have kids that have been in church every Sunday of their lives almost and have parents that are very, very devout. But we don't make a kid, when they come to Evangel, they don't have to sign anything that says, I go to church mm -hmm. or I believe in God, or mm -hmm. I'm a Christian, or, or um, I have uh, a pastor's recommendation. You know, we do, a lot of Christian schools do that. And I, and by the way, I highly respect those places mm -hmm. because they are after one thing, and I'm after another. They have more of a leadership culture where you take a kid that already is on a good path, and you mold him into a great leader. What we hope to do is to take them from A to Z. Mm -hmm. We want to take them where they are. And so we gladly welcome a child that has no background as far as in the scriptures or in his faith, or even comes from a, a family that would be an exemplary, you know, family. And uh, I, I guess the greatest successes that we have experienced, and we know that the glory belongs to God, is seeing those kids that had absolutely nothing as they have been able to realize, hey, I got a chance here. Mm -hmm. These guys are giving me an opportunity to really know some things that I'd have no way of knowing. And, you know, they're not being uh, hypocritical about this. They're, they're really in the game. They're, they're there day after day for me. I can go talk to them. And to watch those kids as they begin to become what we feel God has intended for them to become, that, that's the greatest reward. And we don't want to take it personally because we understand that we've just been vessels for the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to reach their lives. So I imagine you've had some boys come in who are pretty tough nuts. 
I mean, yeah. they come in there and they've got the barbs out and they're like, wait a minute, you have nothing to teach me. How do you deal with kids who are uh, like that, who are troubled when they come in, who are very resistant to what you're going to try to teach them, if they even know? Yes. Well, everybody's treated the same here when it comes to demands. So the moment that they walk into the room, they're surrounded by guys that are under the same kind of mandate that they're under. Mm -hmm. And we allow them to know that at least initially, you know, we are all about performance. Uh, we make it very, very clear that their performance on the field is going to relate to so many things beyond just their fundamental ability to execute their assignment. Mm -hmm. That it's going to be all about other centeredness, for instance. That we expect you to just clear out and know you're not going to get the ball so that another guy can catch the ball. Mm -hmm. We expect you to block for your teammates even when you're not carrying the ball. We, we expect you to speak with respect to everyone who is in authority. We expect you to get up early and to be on time. Mm -hmm. We expect you to be disciplined in your workouts. We, uh, we set the bar high in doing some things that take them out of their comfort zone right away. Mm -hmm. For instance, we don't give anything but standing ovations. So we become the, we become the polar opposite of the culture that has mm -hmm. become so jaded that they hardly applaud at all for anybody for anything. Mm -hmm. So when anything happens in our, in our classroom, there in the, in the field house or at the chapel, when everybody else is just kind of sitting with their arms folded and applause comes about, the kids may be sitting there half hearted, but our boys are standing and they're giving a standing ovation uh -huh. because we want to take them out of their comfort zone because we understand that real success is always out of our comfort zone. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as we begin to teach those things, then we move to the discipline of organization. So when we walk into the classroom and we sit down, I'll walk in and say, straighten those chairs. And immediately, every kid jumps up and begins to make sure that the, the chairs are aligned. And you say, well, why do you straighten chairs? Well, because straightening chairs may be the first step to straighten up your life. Mm -hmm. Maybe the first step to doing some things to come into order with your character. So what we have discovered here is that as we begin to make more and more demands that these kids always rise to the occasion. Are there some kids that don't make it? Yes, there are. In fact, when I took the program, I had five really good football players and the rest were just babies. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I released all five of those players. I, I released them from the school. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because they continued to get around the rules mm -hmm. and they placed some of their younger fellow teammates, I felt in jeopardy and in danger because of their bully attitudes. And so they were gone. Everybody jumped on it all over town. We had, uh, we had TV cameras and the network stations at the front gate and they wanted to know why, you know, pastor slash coach Denny would do such a thing. I never told them because I didn't want to hurt these boys in any way in their reputation. Right. And, uh, you know, but that happens. We, there, we don't reach everybody. But what we've discovered is that those that stay become champions. Mm -hmm. And some of them never win a championship where they get a trophy, but they become champions in life. Um, it's been so much fun. And at 71, I'm having a blast. I wake up every morning with my hair on fire. I cannot wait to work out of my life. Know that, I mean, what a blessing in and of itself to have a job that you love to do. Yeah. Um, it, I love the idea that you raise the bar for because I think that for many young men, yeah. they they feel so much more self-respect when they're treated as though they're capable and strong. And they have a talent that's worth developing rather than saying, well, I'm sorry you had a bad life. Stay in here. I'll do the best I can with you. Um, but what I've seen, even reviewing different schools and school curriculum, when you really ask a lot of young men and they rise, they really develop a tremendous yeah. amount of self-confidence. So I think yes. there are great lessons 
that you're teaching here. So when mm. you when you get these boys, clearly you set very high standards. Clearly you let them know you're in charge, and then it, they it can either listen or not listen. You know they're in or they're out. Um, and then past that, how do you begin to nurture their character and their faith? Because your focus is God, family, football, yes. and I imagine it's in that order. Correct. It really is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so how do you take these boys who know very little about God and maybe don't even know about, have never experienced family? How do you begin to nurture them? Well, the very first thing we do is we give them a Bible, mm. a big Bible. In fact, uh, when I saw the price of the Bible, I went, "Oh, it's eighty-five dollars. <laughs> this Bible's eighty-five dollars. Wow. Yeah, it has mm-hmm. like a, like a leather cover. You know, we're an anomaly. We're on the other side of the track." Tra- private school, you shouldn't be buying $85 Bibles. I mean, here they are. When I found out how much it cost, I said, Ooh, $85. And it was like the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, well, how much do the shoulder pads cost? And I said, Oh, that's so great. Well, we'll we'll stay with the $85. Bible." And so it's leather. It's got their name on it. And I'll never forget the first day when they handed them out. Um, I got up and I said, all right, let's turn to the book of John. And they went, and they were looking at each other like, what? what is the book of John? <laughs> you know, and so I said, "All right, guys." I said, "The reason I got your Bibles all alike is because we go by page number." Because I didn't want them to feel uncomfortable yeah, exactly. for yeah. a moment. I said, "I want you to turn to page uh, fifteen eighty-five, whatever it was." I said, "Turn right now." And so they began. Here's the statement I made to them uh, three and a half years ago. I said, "If you are with us for two years, you will probably know more about the Bible." than anybody in your family. Mm -hmm. Because I hired an old Bible scholar, and he's just a gnarly old guy who is so much fun. Mm -hmm. He's 78 years old. He has orphanages and drug treatment centers and outreach centers and posts all over Southeast Asia. I'm talking about Vietnam and, and Cambodia and Singapore and Malaysia. I mean, this is a legendary guy, right? Mm -hmm. And he's also a Bible scholar. And he also has a way with words so that he never is over anybody's head. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is what I need. I said, you're going to be the first coach I hire. And I said, you're the spiritual coach. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want these kids to have a doctrinal Bible study. He said, a doctrinal Bible study. He said, what do you, do you know what you're asking for? I said, absolutely. I know what I'm asking for. I want a doctrinal Bible study. Mm -hmm. I said, As I prayed, I said, the thing that the Lord impressed on my heart was, these kids don't know what they believe, and they don't know why they believe it. And so I said, I want you to start with the basic doctors of the Bible. I want you to go through. Well, now, those $85 Bibles look like uh, they belong to an old Bible-thumping Baptist or Methodist pastor because they are just at their wide margin so they can write, and they are marked up from cover to cover. And so it's, it's an everyday Step by step, 20 minutes a day, five days a week. Mm-hmm. Every time we meet together, there's a Bible study, a mm-hmm. doctor, a Bible study. And the kids have those Bibles. They're sitting up just, you know, just back straight. And I just excited about getting into the Word of God. And, and you'll see them writing every time that Uncle Irv, which is what we call him, uh, he has a degree in philosophy from the University of Missouri, and he also has these wonderful Bible degrees. But boy, they love their Uncle Irv, and he's just giving them notes, and they're writing all the notes. And this morning, for instance, we had our, our baptismal and all the kids that have received Christ in their life. And so that's what we do uh, when it comes to these kids. How are they transformed? They're transformed, first of all, by getting the Word of God into their lives Mm -hmm. on a daily basis. So we we unapologetically do that. And we have kids from every denomination and background. It doesn't matter. They don't care. The parents, the Presbyterians and the Baptists and Methodists, you know, they can't get along on the street. But boy, do they get along in Evangel. They Mm -hmm. all agree that they want their kids a part of this program. And what we've told people in the past, we said, look, here's the deal. If you're Catholic, then we're going to send the Monsignor a better Catholic. (laughs) I said, if you're Baptist, we're going to send the Baptist pastor mm-hmm. a better parishioner. I said, wait, well, we don't care what church you go to. Right. But you're going to know Jesus. And when you know Jesus, you're going to be better for everybody. What you're doing in the school is so counterculture. 
it is it is so um y- you know we hear about schools um oh where is it now they're stamping out halloween or cuz they don't want to be offensive you know everybody's so afraid of offending another person another person that we end up doing nothing do yeah. do you get much pushback either from um the the, the public or the parents anybody yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the truth is, mate, if, if a parent gives us pushback, then that day's probably the last day for their kid to be there because we, we can't do this yeah. if a parent doesn't at least relent or cooperate. Mm-hmm. We, we don't have to have them totally on board. Mm-hmm. They might not even share the kid's faith, but they're not going to allow us to do things the way that we do them. Then right. we just can't continue. And I hate that because there have been moments where that has transpired, Mm. but very, very rarely because they love the end product of a kid who comes home and suddenly he has respect for his mom and his dad. They're nicer kids. I mean, yeah, they are. They are. And more productive. And by the way, happier. They're just so much happier. And we speak over these kids. We speak life over them and we speak the future that we see in them. You know, you have to, you have to spend some time really uh, considering the personalities and the behavior of these boys so that you can know them and so that you can speak the things that you see already in them, the strengths, but also so that you can hear God and speak destiny and, uh, and a future over their lives. Kids need to be encouraged like never before. Yeah. They need people to just really love them. I mean, when they leave the, uh, when they leave the Bible study every morning, Uncle Herb, I stand at the door and I, uh, I shake their hand. They have to look me in the eye Mm -hmm. every morning. So they shake my hand, good firm handshake, look me in the eye. And then uh, I tell them I love them. I I just shake their hand and look right into their eyes. And I say, "I, I love you. I love you. Every one of them. I love you. So many of them say, I love you back coach, or I love you too. But that's a word that they use in a, a very comfortable way on our entire campus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's incredible because when you just begin to speak the word of God and you begin to live the word of God and you begin to worship, because we're not perfect people. Like we said, mm-hmm. the thing that was my favorite thing about God Family Football was the fact that we didn't do this dog and pony show where we're trying to be this cheesy, always uh, all right kind of culture. Mm-hmm. But in this series, we talk about our challenges. And you see our flaws as coaches, you know. But uh, these kids have so committed themselves to to this process that you can come on our campus. You literally can ride, ride on our campus and mm-hmm. you will feel the presence of God in the air. So you talk about God and then family and football. Yes. <laughs> It it sounds to me like you're creating a family. You're 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 getting these young men to call one another brother, and that's so critically important for any teenager, whether they have a faith or whether they don't. They've got to have that sense they belong somewhere. So, how do you talk about family to some of these boys who may have never really had a family, or yeah. maybe they have a a broken family, or they don't have a dad. So talk about how you instill uh, family values and talk about family when it's pretty foreign or painful for many of them. Well, we do talk about it, but we always mention the elephant in the room. And that is some of, for some of you, the term dad or father may be very painful for you Mm -hmm. because you don't know who your dad is Mm -hmm. or your father in so many ways sinned against you and uh, your mom and uh, he wasn't there for you. He was absentee or he was abusive because in that room, there are always kids like that. I'll never forget. We had a kid that came to us. He was very quiet, but sweet as he could be raised by his grandmother. And we have a lot of that. We don't always know the details, you know, uh, of why that is so. But he's raised by his grandmother. And we had a young man come in and talk about forgiveness to our student body one day. And so this big defensive tackle stands up and walks forward and takes the microphone because it was testimony time. You know, what has this message meant to you? And he told us his story for the first time in that assembly because nobody knew it. Mm -hmm. 
He said, so when I was nine years old, my father murdered my mother. He said, he has been in prison all of these years, so I haven't had either one of them. He said, I have had so much bitterness in my heart that I just wanted to grow up and kill my father. He said, I've held that in my heart all of these years. He said, Mother's Day, I couldn't give her anything. He said, except to visit her grave. He said, it has hurt so badly. He said, but today I have made a decision to forgive my father. And that decision stuck. He went to TCU. I mean, you know how much mm-hmm. that, that yeah. school cost? Yeah, a I mean, lot. That, that's yeah. an expensive school. And he went to TCU, finished in four years, mm-hmm. married a gorgeous girl, lives in California, yeah. makes a great living, has a great life, probably based on one decision that he made in a chapel where he determined to get that thing off of his back that would have con- continually limited him and crippled him the rest of his life. Now, we have got so many stories like that. It's, it's just amazing. You know, your school, as you, as you talk about it and the team, you know, no, imagine any of this happening in a public school or even just a secular private school. It just wouldn't. And here you've had You've helped a young boy get past his mother's murder and his father being in prison. And I think that that alone is just testimony to how good God is. God and, is. you know, and I think you're, this is wonderful. We, we don't, ha- we only have a couple of minutes left, but to end at this point, because you're, the stories that are told in God, family, and football, and the stories yeah. you're telling us here are so inspiring. And that's mm. what's so beautiful about, you know, the docu-series is, is that it's it's real, it's um, got teeth to it. it, you don't make any um, excuses for anything. There's no, oh, I'm, you know, embarrassment. It just mm. is total humility. And um, you have tremendous humility. So with, with just a couple minutes left, Coach, um, if you had a single mother out there or a single father out there who has a freshman or sophomore boy in high school and they're not at a school um, yeah. like Evangel, what kind of an encouragement, what would you tell them that they can do, one or two or three things that they can do to really help their son get on the right track in life? Well, the, the very first thing I would do is make sure that you're aware of who that boy has been influenced by. And probably it's his friends. Uh, There is absolutely no way to have a turnaround in a kid's life until they become accountable. And you, you must hold them accountable. Don't take it for granted that they're hearing the right things from their professor at school. Make sure that you're on it, that you are aware. And that's why like your show is so important. Meg is because it's just uh, increasing awareness and that's what's got to happen in America. Second thing is this, do everything within your power to get them in an environment where people are teaching them your values. Mm -hmm. People say, do you know that it's just going to cost me uh, $50,000 for my child to go to that private school uh, for three years or four years, whatever it is. For us, it would, you know, it'd be less than that because ours is $6,000 a year. And there are schools out there that are Christian schools that are very quality schools where people are sacrificing just like we're sacrificing. And of course, it's a blessed, wonderful sacrifice. I don't even want to call it that. It's such a joy. But there are places that you can enroll your child that are going to help you raise them. In other words, they are going to be the village that is going to help you to instill the values that you are initiating uh, as parents. Mm-hmm. And uh, what does it cost you for a car? Because I can tell you at this stage of life, an education for your child is worth more than an extra car. It, it's worth more than the vacations you take. 
take some of that money and and get your child in a place where they're going to hear the right things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the third thing is this, is don't be too busy to engage your children. And while you're engaging them, make sure you enjoy them. Mm-hmm. Because I've been in so many Christian homes where children are the best thing a parent does as far as what they're most efficient at is reprimanding and yeah. correcting my child. Yeah. The most energy they ever give is in correction. It's never to sit down with them, look across the table, and allow them to share. And let me say this to you. And you've seen this so many times. I know, Meg, and I have too, because I've spent a lot of time in in people's homes through the years as I've traveled with speaking engagements over the last 52 years. And I will see a, a pastor or a believer sitting down at the table with their child. The child can't even look them in the eye. Mm-hmm. There is no conversation. Yeah. None. The child is not engaged. In fact, I've sat down at the table and they said, I want you to sit down here with Pastor Denny or Coach Denny. And they're not interested in talking to me. Right. Because they don't ever talk to anybody else. No, and it, 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 they want to. They want to talk to their. They want to talk to their parents. You know, so often we forget that critical um, point you just made is that we have to know how to enjoy our kids and let them know they're enjoyed. Yes. You know that they're liked, and and even if you have a hard child, and even if they're you know there's a lot of back talk, you can still find a way during those. N- moments that aren't filled with conflict to let them know you like their company. You let them know you like them there. Coach, I could talk to you for a whole nother hour. You have so much to say. I love your stories. And I would just encourage everybody listening. You have to see the docu-series, God, Family, Football. How can uh, people find it? And how can they learn more about the work that you're doing if um, if our listeners wanted to, to know anything? Um, you can find God Family Football on Amazon Freebie. And you can download it for free. It is a free app. Mm-hmm. And it's got all kinds of programs on there. But uh, our little ad will come up almost immediately when you download uh, God Family Football on uh, Amazon Freebie. Okay. And and then also we're, you know, we're on Amazon Prime, uh, you're, you can go there and find us as well. But Freebie is the place where you probably want to go and look. And if they want to, you know, find out about us, they can uh, go to our webpage at Evangel, Evangel, uh, Evangel Academy. My guest, my guest has been the extraordinary coach, Denny Duran, uh, a man of many talents with tremendous amount of humility I have really enjoyed our time together today, and I just hope that um, millions and millions of people will see this documentary. It's so good. 